Beginning at verse 26, they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time, and he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the, the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because... Many demons had entered him, and they begged him that they would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain, and they begged him uh, that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened, and came to Jesus, and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, they were afraid. They also, who had seen it, told them by what means he had uh, been, by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. Now, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. And so it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. The disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we saw last time, had just gone through an incredible storm, a storm that had left them in great fear. And now, as we are looking at this particular story, we, we know that they are physically and we know that they are mentally exhausted. They have been active in ministry. They've been active all day and they've been active into the evening and, and now they are, they are cold and they are wet and they're tired. They are absolutely exhausted. For these disciples, all their desire is, is to arrive at their destination, but there is more to come, and that's what we're looking at today, because they have a demonic welcome wagon waiting for them. This passage that we're looking at today gives to us insight into what is referred to as demon possession. Demons. Now, what are they? Well, demons are fallen angels. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, that when Satan fell, he swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. It is commonly believed that what is being referred to there when it speaks of the dragon, who is also pictured as Satan, that in the rebellion of Satan, there was a certain amount of angels who fell along with him. And those are called today fallen angels. Now, the fallen angels in Scripture are normally simply referred to as demons. They're evil spirits. And as we look in the Scripture, the Scripture points to them as being an actual entity, and we see several things about them. We see that they are evil. We see that they are powerful, very often described as unclean, and they are allied with and under Satan's authority. Jesus, making reference to the authority of Satan in Matthew 12, 26, says, if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself, how then will his kingdom stand? And so in reference to the kingdom, we know that he has authority that he wields over these fallen angels, and therefore Jesus would be referring to his kingdom in that way. Kingdom meaning that he has authority over these fallen angels. Now, the New Testament instances of demonic encounters points demon possession out to be supernatural. Sometimes the individual who is demon-possessed may simply look like they have problems. But Scripture points out that it's not insanity and it is not a disease. Sometimes the outer appearance makes it seem like there's something wrong that's only physical. You see in Luke 13, verse 11, a woman with the spirit of infirmity who is bowed over. That looks physical. In Matthew 9, 32, there's a mute man and so that obviously is physical, and yet it's ascribed to demonic possession. And in, in Matthew 9, 18, there's a little boy who has symptoms of epilepsy. 
But these are manifestations of demonic possession, and Scripture makes it clear that they were not simple illnesses, they were actual supernatural possessions. Now, the man in this particular story that we're looking at uh, appears to be terribly insane. But Luke makes it clear that it is not insanity. He makes it clear that this is a case of demonic possession. Interestingly, for those of you who take notes, Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 through 34 actually tells us that there are two men, but Luke concentrates on just one. And so as we look at this, we're looking at what Luke would refer to as the man of the Gadarenes. Notice verse 26. It says, they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And so they're landing their boat there, and they're exiting on the shore of a place called Gadara. Now, if you were looking at a map, the Gadarenes region, if you were looking at a map and just viewing it and um, looking at it like you were looking at a map of California, because Israel is basically in the same similar, similar configuration as, as the state of California, you'd be looking to the north, into what we would call Northern California. And about three quarters of the way up, there is a lake right in the center, we'll say, of the state. And on that lake, that's the Sea of Galilee or the Lake Tiberias. When you're looking at that lake, north, south, east, and west, the Gadarenes would be on the eastern shore. And we've been there numerous times. We've been to this general region there that Jesus is at. And the Gadarenes is on that portion. So it's on the eastern side of the, of the uh, Jordan River. In that region, there were ten cities. And you'll see this in your scripture when you read about the Decapolis. Deca is ten, polis is, uh, is city, ten cities. And that's a region there to the east that had ten Greek cities, which gives us some insight as to why he would be raising or be amongst, rather, pigs, because the Gentiles inhabited that particular region, and therefore it's very possible that the pigs that we see in this particular story may very well have been owned by Gentile owners, though it doesn't say that. He is in the Gadarenes. Now, in the region, there are caves. You can still see those caves. I mean, when we go in March of 2008, we're going to be going in that region, and you will see that in this hillside, in the hillside up in that area, there are caves that have been carved out, and those caves that have been carved out were used at that time for burial. And so the hills of the region there descend, and they descend there into the Sea of Galilee up to the edge of the water. And it's from the hillside of tombs that this demonized man comes out to meet them. And as he does so, notice verse 27. It says, when he, speaking of Jesus, stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time, but he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but, he says, in the tombs. And so this is a man who is possessed, who is meeting him, a man who has demons and has been so possessed for a long time, the question has to be asked, how does that happen? And I was thinking about that just this evening because the Scripture doesn't really clearly tell us when Jesus encountered these people how it happened. It, it doesn't say exactly, not in the New Testament, how demon possession happens, but we do know this. We do that, know that normally if somebody becomes possessed by a demon, and does it happen today? Yes, it does. Can it happen? Yes, it can. Have I seen this? Yes, I have. Was it a mental illness? No, it wasn't. It was obviously a demonic occurrence. And, and normally what happens is people will open themselves up to demons. You can do it in a variety of ways. You can do it willingly by asking to be possessed. You can actually ask and fill me and, and, and all. And in some occasions, your request is answered. Some people are possessed in that fashion. There's a variety of ways, but normally it is through an invitation of some sort or a dabbling in the occult. Sometimes people get into the occult. They get into the tarot cards. They get into the, the even simple things like we think are harmless parlor games like Ouija boards and all. They can get involved, and that's a gateway. That's one of the entrance ways into the occult and all. And before you know it, you're opening yourself up further and further to things that are demonic and all. We do know this. We know that this man was, uh, was uh, possessed. He was possessed by what is referred to as an impure demon, an unclean demon. We know some of the things that we're going to be looking at, not just by what we see here in, in Luke, but by combining this with Luke, uh, rather Mark, and combining it with Matthew, Mark chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 8. And so that gives to us insight into what's taking place. And so as we look at the passage, we're going to see things about how tormented this guy was. 
And what we're going to do, and this is where it becomes practical in some ways, I would say, is we're going to see how those who serve uh, Satan, how they're treated by him. And I really think that that's something worthy of considering, at least as we enter into our study tonight. We're going to see how Satan treats those who have been yielded to him. Sometimes people think that if I were to just serve the enemy, serve Satan, he'll give me everything I want. I've actually had conversations with people who believe that. Years ago, I was teaching a study, as a matter of fact, something on demonic possession to the high school department because I considered them all demon-possessed and wanted to exercise them. No, I was, I was talking to the kids and um, many years ago now, and uh, somebody knocked on the door, and I had just gone through a similar study that we're looking at. I had just concluded this study. When someone knocks on the door, and uh, I looked up and I said, yes, you know, can I help you? And it was one of our secretaries, and she said, Pastor, could you come here for a moment? And, and so I excused myself, and I went outside for a moment, and I said, what? And she said, there are two young men who want to talk to you. They just came here. And uh, she said, and they, they told me they are servants of Satan, and they wanted to talk to a Christian pastor. And so I looked around for an assistant who wasn't there, so I had to go. <laughs> and when I went out, I, I, I actually came back in and I spoke to the kids and I said, you know, God has given to us an application of this scripture right now. Um, and I said that we just went through a personal application. I said, there are some Satanists outside who want to talk to me, so would you do me a favor and would you lift up this conversation in prayer? Because I'm going to go out and speak to these kids. So I walked outside and I stood outside with these young boys and they began to talk to me and they began to say things to me. You know, uh, uh, you know, you guys, you Christians, and, and they, were, they were angry at Christianity for some reason. Make a very long story short, as we were speaking, um, they said to me something like this. They said, Satan is, uh, is, is the king. Satan is powerful. Satan defeats God, and Satan defeated Jesus Christ, and that's why we follow him. And I remember looking at these boys, and I said, it's an interesting thing to me that you guys are telling me that Satan is the ruler and king and fulfills your wishes, but it is you seeking out a Christian to speak. It's not the Christian seeking you out. And don't you see that what you have is leaving you empty? And they had done something. They said, we, we just need to talk to somebody because we did something that we cannot tell you about, but it's something that even we are shaken about. And I have to tell you, I, I came away wondering, what is it? Never discovered what they did, by the way. but. Is it real? Is it real that people actually do worship Satan? Is it real that people open themselves up to the demonic? Absolutely, absolutely. And so that's what we're looking at right here. We're looking at how Satan treats those who come to worship him. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said this. He said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So what is the fruit of following Satan? Well, one, I want you to notice here that it says in verse 27, he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. Well, one of the things, very obviously, is you can end up living in a neighborhood you never thought you could live in. He's living in a tomb. He lived in tombs. This is an area that was carved out hillsides and, and cliffs, he started believing that that was the only place that he could live. You can get used to living in, in places that you didn't think you'd ever end up in because you think that that's all there is to life. So living in a cemetery reveals to us that this man was completely defiled. The law of Moses made it clear that Jews were not to come into contact with dead bodies, and yet that's all he came into contact with. The second thing you can lose all sense of morals. This is a man who roamed about completely naked, which speaks about a shameful life. He had lost all sense of modesty. He had lost any sense of shame. And so Satan wants you to no longer feel embarrassment by the things that you do. I mean, some, I, I, I believe when the enemy leads you down his path, he causes you to lose some very basic things that at one time you had, you had reservations about. I mean, even, even small children have a modesty about them. As they begin to grow a little bit older, they begin to be more modest. I mean, if they're one or two or even into their third year of life, 
you know, they may come running out without their diaper and everything, and eh, you don't think anything about it, of course, and they don't either, and sometimes they run around entertaining you, and you ask, go put your clothes on, you know. But when you get older, you get a sense of modesty. But when you're following the enemy, it's amazing how he will break down your modesty to the point where you lose any shame. I have seen more than one um, film at 11 on the gay parades. You know, and when you see the things that these people do with absolutely no shame whatsoever, it has to give to you some insight into the, what the enemy does. He takes away your sense of feeling embarrassment. A, a third thing is he encourages angry hatred towards others. This one was tormented, and, and the other Gospels point out that he was actually pushed towards violence towards other people. Matthew 8, 28 says that they were so violent that no one could pass that way. And so this is what he does. The enemy moves, moves you towards anger and not loving, not compassion. And a fourth thing is uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 4 tells us that no one could bind him even with chains. Um, and people grew to have tremendous fear of him and avoided him. That's because the enemy can move you towards violence. You can become violent. Uh, a fifth thing is that he was night and day in the mountains and in the tombs and was, in other words, in constant torment. There was no break in the action. There was no time when he could rest. And Mark chapter 5, verse 5 also tells us he was constantly crying out and cutting himself with stones. He's self-destructive. See, demons are, 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 demons are intend, intending harm towards us, and ultimately they will push you to harm yourself. It interests me how it says in Mark 5, 5 that he was cutting himself. I wonder, you know, I don't want to go on record saying that I believe this is exactly true and therefore I have to be careful. But I wonder if the enemy still doesn't push people towards harming themselves. I wonder because, because I, I meet young people who take razor blades and slice themselves, wound themselves. You know, that most certainly isn't the Lord pushing them to do that. You know, and you see the demonic influence. You see what is taking place. So he's harming himself, cutting himself, crying out. He is self-destructive. This is someone who has got an incredible amount of torment and wants to destroy himself. His existence is unbearable, and he constantly is trying to end it all. But what happens? Well, it says in verse 28, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. And so he begins to speak to him, and he begins to ask him, you know, please don't torment me. What are you doing to me? Um, have you, what have, but the, the, the interesting thing in verse 28 is, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? Is there anything that he has in common with Jesus Christ? And the answer is no. He has nothing in common with him. They have nothing in common with one another. If you take notes, John 14, verse 30, Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. We have nothing in common. So when the question is, what have I to do with you? The answer is nothing. We have nothing in common. But he says to, to him, I implore you, don't torment me. I don't want to go into that abuso. I don't want to go into the pit. I don't want to go before my time. Now, as this is taking place, verse 30, Jesus asks him a question. What is your name? And he says, Legion. Now, why is that significant? That's significant because it gives to us an insight into the depths of his bondage. A legion in Rome was 6,826 soldiers. And so what he's speaking about is, I am severely in bondage. And that's why Jesus asks him his name. And so in verse 31, he goes on and he says, they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now, a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain, and they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. The demons went out of the man and entered the swine, 
and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. And so when you're looking at this particular region there, it is commonly believed that, that the hills sloped on down and went all the way to the lip of the lake. And so these swine would have been up there on this hillside and they rush on down and they fall into the water there. And so you have two things in history that are unique. One is you have deviled ham, and then two, <laughs> that was the creation of the Bay of Pigs. And so as this took place, thank you for laughing, I do appreciate that. <laughs> What's interesting is they asked Jesus for permission. There's no reason given for him allowing this to take place, he simply did. Perhaps they hoped when the pigs were lost that the city would reject Jesus. They knew that people care for material comforts and spiritual. And so they go and they enter and they die. Now, in verse 33, reading on, the demons went out of the man, entered the swine, the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. And then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. And so what do they see? And, and this is where I want to get kind of practical I think for a moment share a little bit with you from my heart about a couple of things. What do they see? Well they see a man who had formerly been naked and out of his mind seated at the feet of Jesus Christ, clothed and in his right mind. So what they see is an amazing miracle that took place. They see a radical transformation. Let's get practical with this. One, I don't know how crazy you were before you came to Christ. I don't know. In our fellowship, we have some people who were such saints from the time they were small, and, you know, they never really did anything wrong. I, I still remember one of the, who used to be on our staff, one of our, our gals, a sweetheart, you know, and I, I, had my, um, I had my staff giving their testimonies, and each one was to share, you know, what their background was prior to coming to Christ. Everybody was giving their testimonies, and some of them were pretty radical. And then this young gal gives her testimony, and she was one of our secretaries, and, and as she was sharing, she said, you know, uh, you know, the worst thing I've ever done is I, I toilet papered somebody's house. And she still felt bad about that, you know. And I am thinking, man, you know, you know, you're Jesus as far as I'm concerned. You, know, you think that was bad. I mean, and she's ashamed. I toilet papered somebody's house. Yeah. I mean, you may be like that. That may be the depth of your testimony. And I say, oh, God bless you, because the keeping grace of God is equal to the saving grace of God. You know, sometimes people come up with, and, and they give their testimonies, and, and you hear them, and you look at them, and you say, man, that ought to be a movie. I mean, that is so heavy, you know, what you went through. And, and I'll tell you something. God's transforming power, especially in the lives of people who have radically served the enemy, is an incredible testimony. And that's what you see in this man. A man that was fierce and frightening, a man who was severely demon-possessed, violent, who was suicidal, who had been yielded over to the enemy to the point where people wouldn't even pass by where he was because he'd come out of the tombs and he would frighten them. This man is now tamed. This man is now at the feet of Jesus Christ, and he's sitting there like a lamb at the feet of its master. And these people see this, and it blows their mind. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What an incredible testimony when God grabs hold of your life and transforms you. And a radical transformation does take place. One of the promises God gives to us in Revelation 21, 5 is simply, behold, I make all things new. And the Lord does. You can have the most radical background. You could have been somebody who was into whatever you can imagine and all, and then Jesus Christ grabs hold of your life and makes you unrecognizable to those who know you best. That's how the Lord changed my life, and that's what impacted my family. 
was that radical transformation from darkness into light instantaneously. It's like when you walk into this room. We don't have any windows here. And so when those doors are closed and the other hall doors are closed, this room is pitch black. But you walk in and you hit the switch and instantly the light is gone. Uh, the darkness is gone because the light is on. And that's what happens. God grabs hold of your life and instantly transforms you, and the darkness flees because the light is present. And that's what took place here. So that can shock people. It can be so radical that they see that, and they think something bad happened to you. I can still remember a cousin of mine, when I got saved, he didn't like it. He didn't like the transformation of my life. He did not like it, and he told me. He said, David, what happened to you, man? He said, you used to be fun to be around. He said, and now you're all changed. You're all different. And he did not like it. You see, because before I got saved, yeah, people, people kind of liked being around me because I was crazy, because I did crazy things, because I'd go to a party, and, and if there was music playing and nobody was dancing, because I would get up by myself in the middle of a dance floor and just spin around and do a bunch of dumb things that, uh, just to make people laugh. And they would. Because one of my friends was driving down the street and I was standing on the hood of his car on one, one, with one leg and my arms out like a living hood ornament, driving down the street. And my mom's looking out the window as I drive by the house at 25 miles an hour. And, and she hits the window so hard and I hear her screaming and so I tell him, you better pull over. And I pull over and I go home. I said, what do you want? She said, you're crazy. You are absolutely crazy. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> For sure. I mean, what sane person does that? I mean, I could tell you story after story. And so my cousin is upset because I'm not fun anymore. Because God had given me a purpose for living that was so radical that my life was absolutely transformed. You know, I hope you don't mind me sharing another thing, but, but to me, it, it was, it, it's something, I guess, worth sharing at this point. When I graduated from high school, I mean, I hardly went to school in my junior and my senior year. I, I cut uh, classes, any class after lunchtime in my junior year, I just wasn't there. I mean, I was too busy doing something else. I didn't want to go to school. So I'd go in the morning, but any classes after, after lunchtime, I just didn't show up. So naturally, I failed. As a senior, um, you know, I, I, I showed up just when I had to. I would go to school, but I didn't try at all. I didn't ever read. I didn't ever study. And so when I graduated, which I, 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 I did graduate, and when I graduated, um, I graduated with, I believe, uh, just barely made it. I think it's like a D, D minus average. I just, I mean, I just made it out of high school, right? And so because I wouldn't read. I mean, the only books that I ever would read were comic books, you know, and, I, and, and that was about it. I didn't read any books and, and anything like that for the longest time. And so when I turned 20 and I got saved, um, God started doing some things in my life. And I got drafted, and, and that's another long story. I ultimately went into the military in March, March 15th, 1971. When you go into the Army, they give to you, in the first week that you're there, they give to you a battery of tests. You have to take a variety of tests in order for them to classify you. And so you'll, you'll take tests like two or three days in a row, and it's all day. So you'll be taking tests in a variety of things like that. And so this is a guy with a D minus average who hadn't read a book since I was, uh, you know, you know for, for a long time. I had just recently begun reading again. And they're giving me uh, IQ tests, they're giving me a variety of things. And before you know it, they're asking me if I want to go to West Point because my, because my intelligence, and I don't know how to say this, I, I, I'd like to say it in a way that seems more modest, but I'm just trying to give you the truth. They wanted to put me into West Point because I was able to go in because of, because of my IQ. Then they gave us this other test where you, you, you have to take these nonsensical words and you have to give it meaning and interpret it, and now they're wanting to send me to Monterey to linguistic school because I have a gift for learning and acquiring languages. And there I am as a guy thinking, you've got to be kidding me. One, I'm not going to West Point. I don't care what you do. That, that's out of the question. Because I had been born again, and all I wanted to do was my time so I could get out and go to church and fellowship and grow as a Christian, and it was just tough. 
but I was honored at the same time. And I remember looking back at that time and I, I'm thinking, man, Lord, there I am sitting at the feet of Jesus in my right mind. That's the point I'm trying to make. God can take you and, and transform you to something unre unrecognizable to others who know you best. And that's what happened in my life. That's what God does in people's lives. I mean, I don't know what your testimony is like. I don't know where you were at. But I will tell you this. If you'd have told me when I was 17, 18, 19, even the day before I got saved at 20, that one day I would be pastoring this church doing the things that I do, I'd have thought you were out of your mind. The thought of me being at the feet of Jesus in my right mind following him, you have got to be kidding me. The thought of being a pastor, teacher, the, the thought of doing the things that God has opened the doors for me to do. But that's what God does in people's lives, you see. God radically does works in you. Only, he does things that only God can do in you. Where your friends are avoiding you because you're so violent, because your friends don't want to be around you, because you just, you're crazy. They're, they don't want anything to do with you. you know? and, and now, you're the kind of person that they actually will come and ask advice from. You're the kind of person that they'll say, you know, you pray, could you pray for me? You're the kind of person where they'll say things like, you know, you read the Bible, don't you? Yeah. And well, you know, I want to ask you a question. Those are things that happened to me. I can still remember people before I was pastoring. I can still remember getting phone calls and saying, hey, you know, Dave, you read the Bible? Yeah. Well, what's this book of Revelation about? What's it mean when it says? You know, the, they're asking me, the guy who used to dance on a dance floor by myself, the guy who used to stand on a, on a, on a hood, you know, being, they're asking me about God? That's what happens. It's radical. When the Lord grabs hold of your heart, it is radical what he can do with you. You know, I want to encourage you in that. I want you to know that, that you know, I, the enemy had you, and what he did in your life was to destroy you. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. He's a destroyer. No doubt about that. But when Jesus Christ grabbed hold of you, he transformed you. He gave you a new life. He gave you a new mind. He gave you a new motive. He gave you a new everything. And that's what I live in. That's, that's what I wake up to. I remind myself of what he's done in me. Because the enemy reminds me of what I've done before. And he does. I don't know about you, but I get reminded fairly often. I get reminded every day, almost the first thing in the morning. Seriously. Every day. For the last 30 some years, the first thing that I have in the morning is a memory of what I was. Every day. Every day. And every morning, I remind him of what I am. Every day. I'm not kidding you. And it can happen throughout the day where he'll say, You were this, and you were that, and you said this, and you were like that. I don't know if I should tell you that, but that's what goes on in my life every day, all the time, and every day, all the time, I say, I'm new in Jesus Christ, brand new, every day. And I mean that sincerely. The reason I hesitate to say those things to you is because I don't want you to think I'm puffing myself up. What I'm trying to be is open and honest. That's a fact. That's what I was. And I do wake up, and I do remember. I do. And I always do the same thing. Lord Jesus, I'm new in you. I'm new in you. That's the past. I don't want to act like that. I don't want to think like that. I don't want to be like that. I just want what you want for me. And, uh, yeah, you know, sometimes it can appear, oh, look how easy it is. Paul said, I die daily. I die daily. And it is dying daily. I pick up my cross daily, and I die daily, and I follow him. That's Christianity. It's not easy. It may seem easy. It's impossible without Jesus. It's impossible without his spirit. It's impossible if you don't say, I'm going to gird myself up today. I'm going into battle. The enemy wants to take you out. He wants to destroy you. You see, this man here, he had enough. He knew what it was like to live filled with demons. And all he wants is to be with Jesus. Look what's taking place. Now, the people in verse 30, 34, they saw what happened. 
And they ran off and they spoke about it. And then for, verse 35, they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and, and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind. They were afraid. They also had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon possessed was healed. And the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes, now notice this, asked him depa to depart from them for they were seized with great fear and he got into the boat and returned. You don't want anything to do with the Lord. You can drive them away. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? They said, we see what took place, but we're afraid. We don't want anything to do with you. I find that to be absolutely fascinating. Instead of re recognizing that Jesus Christ can transform even the most horribly lived life into something beautiful, they don't want him even to be around. And so they say, depart. He got in the boat and returned. Now, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. Wouldn't you want to do that too? I mean, think about it for just a moment. Wouldn't you want to do that too? I mean, there you are, clothed in your right mind. Your body still has wounds that you had just recently, you know, done to yourself. I mean, there you are with the Lord, and you're finally in your right mind. You know, that's, that's what happened with, with me, and it's what happened with most of us, I'd say, in this room, is, is he healed me, and I, I said, I just want to be with you. I just want to spend time with you. I want to follow you. That's what I'm supposed to do. But it's interesting what the Lord does. Jesus sent him away in verse 39 and said to him, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. I want you to see that. Tell him what God did, and what does he say? This is what Jesus did. Because Jesus is God in the flesh. Your life is ministry. Never forget it. Sometimes you may be thinking, well, pastors are ministers. You know, staff ministers, missionaries. You're a minister. We've all been saved to serve. And we all have a testimony. You have a testimony on the job. You have a testimony in your neighborhood. You have a testimony in your family. You have a testimony in your school. You are known for something. I was known for being crazy. But you were known for something too. And when you're there at the feet of Jesus in your right mind, you've got people that you can speak to and you should. You should. I've, I've had people say to me, wasn't it difficult telling your dad and your mom that they needed Jesus Christ? And the answer is, no, it wasn't. But I'll tell you why it wasn't. Two reasons. One is my mom gave me permission to speak truth. You know, she, she taught me to speak the truth, to tell the truth. So she gave me permission to do that. So I wasn't disrespecting them. But two, it wasn't difficult because I wanted them to go to heaven. I didn't want them to go to hell. I, I believed in hell, and I believed in heaven, as, as I do today. So if Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me, and if Mama and Dad don't know him, then I had better tell them what Jesus can do in a life. Made sense. And that's exactly what he has us do. Notice that, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. That's your testimony. This is what the Lord has done for me. Now they do watch you. They do wanna see whether or not you're gonna be consistent if you're real. Over time, you just demonstrate that through the fruit of your life. So being in your right mind and telling people how it happened is ministry. That's why I would encourage you to be inviters. Invite people to know the Lord. Invite people to your church if this is your church. If this isn't your church, invite them to your fellowship so that they might hear messages that might change their life, so that they might come to know Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing for them, that they might know the Lord. Because, you see, ministry all flows from a life that has simply been touched by Jesus Christ. That's where it flows from. 
And that's why he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. And so it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting. On the one hand, you have people say, leave. But on the other hand, you have people say, we've been waiting for you. What an interesting way. Some people say, go away, and others are waiting for him to show up. I think that's true in ministry, by the way. Sometimes you'll be sharing with somebody about the Lord, and they don't want to hear it. And the person right next to him does. The person right next to him does. You might be concentrating on one person when the Lord is speaking to somebody else. I've had that happen more than once in my life. And he's talking to somebody else. The same message that causes people to say, oh, I've had it, I'm out of here, is the message that caused other people to get saved. Same message. The same sun that, that, that hardens concrete melts wax. The same message that somebody's hardened against, well, that's the message that softens somebody else and they receive Christ. So all you need to do is just keep sharing and keep living. Tell people what Jesus did for you and watch what he'll do. And all you have to do is just sit at his feet in your right mind and he will send you out to do works of ministry.